In a stunning revelation, the National Security Advisor of Nigeria, uh, Nohuri Badu, disclosed uh, that the current government uh, of President Bola Tinubu inherited a financially crippled nation from the previous government led by former President Muhammad Buhari. This revelation has sparked a bold call from the Human Rights Writers Association of Nigeria, uh, a civil society group, for the arrest and prosecution by no less an organization than the International Criminal Court. Well, tonight we have uh, scheduled an interview with a representative of Huriwa uh, to delve into the implications of this uh, call they've made. Uh, also, the alleged human rights violations uh, and economic challenges faced by the country. Unfortunately, they are not able to join us at this point. Uh, but also, the call for transparency and accountability in Nigeria's governance takes center stage as uh, Peter B, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, challenges the federal government led by President Bola Tinubu. Uh, Obi, a former governor of Anambra State, insists that Nigerians deserve a full disclosure of the assets and deficits inherited by Tinubu's administration from the past government of ex-president Muhammad Buhari. Now, uh, the only person, uh, the person who's been speaking, Malam Nuri, about is not the only one. The country's president himself, the country's president himself, Bola Metinbu, on Monday night in Saudi Arabia, did say, did say that he inherited huge liability. He made a speech in Saudi Arabia to investors. He said he inherited a huge liability. So that premise that Peter B made his statement, put it out on his X platform. Tonight on Politics H, we delve into the implications of this demand, addressing the questions uh, around fiscal responsibility and the realities of governance in Nigeria. Is this call by Peter Obi, an opposition politician, is calling for transparency? Is this a genuine call for transparency or are there underlying political motivations? We want to introduce a panel of guests tonight. We expect to be joined by Malo Wubiko, like I said, uh, uh, the founder of Human Rights Writers Association. Also, we expect to be joined by, we are joined actually by Ibrahim Ismail Umar. He's a member of the uh, Labour Party's um, media team. Uh, also, we expect to be joined by Kletus Obun. He's a former lawmaker and I believe member of the All Progressives Congress. Uh, but very welcome to you. A big welcome to you, Ibrahim Ismail Umar. Thank you very much. Okay, Kletus, I'm told we have Kletus Obun on the line. Kletus, thank you very much for your time. Having me tonight. All right. Uh, I, I take it you're a member of the All Progressives Congress. Am I correct? Very correct. All right. Are you a former lawmaker? A founding member of the party. Okay. A founding and... foundation member of the party. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, what are your thoughts on this call uh, by the Human Rights uh, Writers Association? They've been uh, in the news a lot, always, you know, advocating for, you know, human anger, human interest, human rights and all that. And today, based on what President Bola Tinubu said in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, and based on what Malam Nuhuribadu said uh, about the state of the country's finances when they came on board, uh, that President Buhari should be arrested, uh, not just arrested, prosecuted, not just prosecuted by anyone, but by the International Criminal Court. What's your take on this, Cletus? Well, I think uh, coming on the heels of uh, about five months in government, on the heels of what Nigerians went through during the elections in terms of uh, Naira redesign and uh, a situation which found us Nigerians buying the Naira as if we were looking for dollar or euro. And uh, presently uh, in dire straits on a, as a consequence of not just the first subsidy removal, but from national and global economic crisis, which has seen several countries and several protests across Europe, America, and Latin America. The world is totally in an economic meltdown, and Nigeria is not expected to be insulated or isolated from this global crisis. Be that as it may, we have had the hue and cry about our level of corruption. I agree completely that Corruption has become a major crisis for Nigeria, and our economy cannot continue to wobble and crumble under the weight of corrupt governmental officials 
and even private officials, private individuals in this country have also aided and abated corruption. So it is not governmental corruption, it is just monumental corruption that has become a malaise for the entire country. Now, the present cause by the president's complaint that we inherited a debt, that is nothing new. There is no spectacle in it, except that we are trying to exacerbate and exaggerate the circumstances under which he said that and the context in which he said so. For him to admit that we have a debt, if he also admitted that we had excess, excess crude oil funds as we had in 2014, 2013, 2012, where we used to share excess crude oil in which the then minister, coordinating minister for the economy of Kujiwala, presently in the World Trade Organization, has told us at that time that that money should be put into a sovereign fund. If we put all that in perspective and come to understand what is happening today, it was a predictable and predicted situation in which we got several warnings from experts, not less a person like Okonjo Wale, who told us that there shall come a day like this where we shall rely on the sovereign wealth fund. And she was bold. In fact, the state organized across party lines to take the federal government of Jonathan to court, insisting like robbers that every cover must be shared and there was no need to save when the country was crumbling. At a time when we were going in excess over 40, 50% of our baseline in terms of oil prices, where we were budgeting 65% benchmark, we were getting 115, 110, 105 in excess of what we anticipated. And the normal thing to do in an economy of land nature would have been this. So without blaming the past for our present woes, even though we cannot escape it, let it be known that the cause for the arrest of persons, for me at this point, is only going at the root of our dysfunctional system in which institutions are lame, inactive, decapitated by the weight of individuals. Okay. So ICPC sits back there, a vice chancellor, an army garrison commander, a principal of a school, gets involved in all kinds of sleaze and no repercussions. I remember the president's wife, the last president's wife, Aisha Buari, had come out to say, because there are no consequences, people are not punished for what they do, that we are going to get worse. She was referring to this moment and these issues. Today, Ribadu should know better. He has been a, a, a financial, anti-financial crimes that, uh, 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 czar. He has been an anti-financial crimes czar who was reputed to have done so much and therefore making him an NSA at this point, I know that his eye and specialty would be on corruption and uh, corruption agents. Having called for the uh, Buhari, I will tell you this, it is on account of vicarious responsibility. That is to say for abdicating his responsibility to check his lieutenants. Even if you look at Jonathan, many say he was weak. And that's why he couldn't control. Will you also say that a retired general with a very austere life, personal life, could tolerate the volume of sleaze that we saw and the volume of corruption that is being exposed today? If that is so, then Nigeria must have to go back to a drawing board in which leadership, again, as Achebe had postulated before now, must be re-examined. And our recruitment process and our training process for leadership in Nigeria must be reviewed. It is not for want of laws. It is the want of the lack of the use of the laws of this land. There is nothing under this earth, under this country called Nigeria that has not been legislated okay. and it's not in our right. laws. Tetsu, thank you so much. Um, so you, you're yes. saying basically the same old story. Jonathan met, uh, Buhari met uh, uh, um, uh, economy in recession or he met economy on his way to recession and uh, there were difficulties there. I think the major challenge uh, for Buhari at the time was the fact that the global crude oil prices, which is Nigeria's main source of revenue, you know, arguably only source of revenue to a large extent, had plunged in, in from $93.17, an average of $93.17 in 2014, to $48.66 by 2015. And that meant that the government had to source for funds from elsewhere to, to fund the budget because the budget was premised on 
a higher benchmark. Um, but that being said, it could be argued that under Buhari, the crude oil price experienced a steady increase, you know, at some point in 2022, peaking at $94.53, which was higher than what he made it at $48.66. You know, so what do you say to that argument? Hello, are you there, please? Is it me? Okay, yes, we can. Are you yes. To me? yes, yes, let us please go on. Oh, yes, I will tell you this. In fact, I'm happy that you are really understood. At a point, it came to $22. Don't forget that. While that was excusable and accounted for the loan that were collected at that time to fill that gap, at the point of increase, you will discover that you are digging a new hole to fill an old one. So there came a time in which there was no purchase at all. Nigerian oil was roaming in the high seas and nobody to buy. Then came the global pandemic, coronavirus, in which the entire world was shut down. That is agreeable. Arguably, you will also agree that immediately after that, the recession, Nigeria dramatically, miraculously recovered from the recession faster than even the World Bank anticipated. Three agencies had anticipated Nigeria would go under. Nigeria miraculously survived it. That credit must be given to them. But we are saying, even in that power city of funds, even in that lack, men mindlessly, spinelessly, still fished and dip their hands into the paltry pulse that Nigeria at that point had. We cannot deny that fact. What we are discussing today is to the effect that what impact does it have on Nigeria, given the debt burden, given the infrastructure deficit, and given the near absence of checks and balances, even from institutions established for that purpose. I think that is where we are. We should be discussing solutions, having identified the problems. Any Nigerian from the nooks and crannies of this country, from the lowest, the most illiterate, hunger does not understand English or Arabic. Hunger does not understand the Bible or the Quran. A, a Muslim that is hungry is as hungry as a Christian that is hungry, like an atheist that is hungry. Therefore, hungry has no language or boundary. It has no color. So if we are discussing that our country has gone under on account of several of these barometers of measuring and the index of measuring the economy, then we have a duty as a country to sit back and look for solutions. And for me, that is where we should start from. So identifying the, the president. Yes, yes. But one of the solutions, Cletus, uh, one of the solutions would be to to get Buhari uh, prosecuted because, um, like, that's what uh, who we are saying. But where did all the money uh, that Muhammad Buhari took as loans? Where did these monies go to? Where did the money One from the, things, the sale of Nigeria's crude oil of $94.53 in 2022, $68.17 in 2021, where did all these monies go to? I have, you have admitted here that the meltdown of the economy meant that Nigeria economy, like all other economies all over the world, till today, only last week I was reading how a portion of California was being deserted because young men have gone to the streets to walk into shops and take things by force and snatch things all over the place. When we are talking about Buhari's prosecution, I will also want to avert your mind that what, one of the things that kept Buhari down was his, the poor management of his information team. The poor information team that didn't give out information on a lot of things that were done and were never ever discussed. Did you remember that ahead of time, when the insurgency was presiding over the country and portions of this country, that Tucano jets were being purchased, and the National Assembly even had insisted when he was trying to stop the cost from going up because if he didn't pay at the time, it would have been a crisis. Do you remember that it used to take four or five hours to go to Makodi, and today that road is dualized? Do you remember that for those of us from the border towns of Camwood, Cameroon, in southwest, south, south Nigeria, Econ Bridge and the Mfum Bridge at the border with Cameroon, that these bridges have been completed and that of the 215 kilometers 
going to Calabar. Only 70 kilometers of that road is still left. And you can go on and on, yet you still have deficits like the East-West Road, which is uh, the East-West Road, which is a major, major corridor for the Southwest and the South-South. All these are deficits, but you should also remember that a lot of things have been done. But in asking for his persecution, it is about those of, look at the Niger Delta Development Commission, for example. That is a cesspool. Uh, Mr. Like, Mr. Like Clancy, the, Clancy Sobon, I want you to just repeat yourself. Which, uh, you know, parts of Re Cross River State did you mention uh, you had money spent the, on by, by uh, Buhamud Buhari? The Econ Bridge. The okay. Econ Bridge, those who know it, it used to be on NTA, being advertised as one of the best bridges in Nigeria. Okay. On NTA. It used to be one of the, uh, the, 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 the adv adverts. Then the one at the form where there is a, a crisis within the Cameroon insurgents. Okay, and Mr. Clancy Sobon, you need to relax, sit back that into your chair. That bridge has also been done. Yeah, you need to sit back and into your chair. And then from come to Calabar. Yes, you need to sit back into your chair so we, we can see you properly. Um, just relax okay. into your chair, yes. I, I know Cross River State like the back of my hand. Uh, is so the I'm road... giving you the data now. Yeah, yes. Is the you road... The road Calabar, um, yes, tell us please, yes. Is the road from Calabar all the way to Ecom, uh, is it... Is it is it motorable now? Has it been refurbished? kilometers, 70, no. only 70 kilometers. You only have Calabar all the, all the way to Odupani, Odupani all the way to no. Akangpa. Akangpa no. to the from black Calabar, zone. From Calabar to Ehom. Calabar, yeah. Calabar to Ehom is not completed. Calabar to Ehom is not, from, from Ehom down to Ecom is all completed. All right, so the Ehom, entire stretch of the Calabar, Ecom, Ecom Ogoja, Road is 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 it is it, it motorable? Road, portion, portion of that road up to Form Junction down to your head is the Trans African Highway. Is the Trans African Has Highway? Has it been completed so all the way down they, to the tip of Benue State? Then from um, Form Junction to Epobina Junction, my local government junction, down to your head or Abochiche, the whole of that portion is terribly bad as of today. So terribly bad. Okay, it's less because, than because I want to be able to be sure of what you were saying. So the Calabar yes. uh, Ikombo Goja Road is still in a bad shape, but some portions have been rehabilitated. Is what you're saying? No, no, no. The whole of Ikombo Goja Road down to Umfam Junction, 15, 20 kilometers to Goja, the whole of that road is completely tired. In the last okay. three or four years, it has been on. All right, all you right. You can move from there to but, but, but you can talk about you can talk about the Calabar. Uh, E2, your road. How about that? That's uh... that. That is the disaster and tragedy of our place. Last week, just last week, I was going to record a connect from Calabar to Uyo is 50 minutes maximum. I took three hours and missed my flight. Three okay. hours for a 50 minutes drive. Three hours. It looks as if that place is not in the Niger Delta, and that is why the agitation for Niger Delta from so, Niger so, so, you, you, so what, therefore, what case are you trying to make that Buhari spent the money on what? If the major road leading into Calabar, um, I was never touched, was not done, you know. So, and we have several, you know, roads around the country that are begging uh, for uh, for attention, which is what the, currently the president is saying that he is going to fix those roads under his renewed hope agenda. And it could be argued that that's why I asked you the question. All the loans that Buhari took 2015, uh, 11.51 trillion naira, 2016, 17.06 trillion naira, 2017, 21.21 trillion naira, 2018, 25.7 trillion naira, 2019, 33.07 trillion naira, 2020, 36.12 trillion naira, 2021, 39.55 trillion naira, 2022, 42.85 trillion naira, 2023, which was a year he just did have, uh, it took 44.02 trillion. Uh, what were those money used for? This is just a, a tip of the iceberg of the uh, loans, the public debt that Mahal Buhari incurred as president. He left Nigeria's mid Nigeria's debt uh, at approximately uh, 11.51 trillion naira and increased it to more than 87 trillion naira before he left, you know. Um, so that's why I asked where did these monies go to. But I want to bring it at this point. When, when you make me the unofficial spokesperson, when you make me an unofficial spokesperson for the Buhari regime, that would be most unjust and unfair. I was never part of that government. I, when I mean I was never part, I was never an official. But as a Nigerian, I speak as an analyst because I travel across this country. Therefore, I can say 
with some modicum, some level of accuracy, that it is not all bleak. Because traveling across the country, I can see clearly that there were projects that were started. And as I say, he will vicariously pay for the things that his officials did and he couldn't control. While admitting that something was done in Steelers, I will also tell you that a lot was taken out of the system without his intervention and without him making any statement about it as leader whose table, on whose table the box tops. Curtis, you, 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 said, Curtis, you said a lot was taken out of the system. By who? Bida Buhari is a... By officials of his government without him taking full responsibility and taking charge. All right. Well, so where, where was he? Was he unable? Was he unaware of uh, the officials in his government taking these monies away? You know, to the personal. That's what I mean by him not taking action. So he should answer for his vicariously. Okay. That is to say, by implication, for not saying anything, he had said so much by not doing anything again or taking action or proceeding against such persons. I know a few persons were taken up, but those were, that was just a tip of the iceberg because I am using Niger Delta as a paradigm the Niger Delta as a paradigm. The monies of the Niger Delta, most of it was never paid, but even the one that was paid until then Minister of Niger Delta, now Senate President, came out with a forensic audit. Nigerians didn't know that 14,000 jobs that were impacted on the Niger Delta region, a volatile region that is the, uh, the, the golden, that lays the golden egg for this country, have been abandoned and totally obliterated from developmental projects. That is one area in which I can tell you that if any prosecution must take place, that is where it should take place. All right. Because All right. people who did and completed jobs were not paid, while those who, are, who did nothing and collected government monies were never... All right. Let Let them bring the Thank you very much. Part. We'll come back to that in the Jiffy. I want to introduce... The report uh, of the forensic audit that the yes. senior president, the president and president undertook, must okay. be brought out at this time. All right. Interesting. Claire what I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm glad to say Imano Hobiko uh, of uh, Huriwa is here, national coordinator. Imano, thank you so very kindly for your time. Uh, Huriwa, in calling, in calling for uh, Buhari's arrest and prosecution by the ICC, what specific actions or decisions by the former president uh, are considered as contributing to the alleged economic bankruptcy inherited by the, uh, by the current administration? Imano Hobiko. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Emmanuel. Can you hear me, please? Good evening, good evening. I'm my wife, not Emmanuel. Oh, yeah, good evening. Case in the house? Yes, this is for the Huriwa man, please. Yes, I'm hearing you now. I don't know if you can hear me. Loud and clear, please go on. Oh, okay. I, we in the Human Rights Writers Association of Nigeria, we are not um, we are not so much uh, concerned for now about the massive corruption that took place during the eight years administration of the immediate past president because um, uh, we believe that as as we we go along in you know in the very near future, maybe in the next couple of months, things will begin to, things will begin to uh, unravel, you know. Our major concern is about the uh, kind of uh, serial killings, killings that took place consistently during the ATA regime, I mean, ATA uh, administration of that, um, that, uh, you know, uh, that government. Particularly, it was when uh, Muhammad Buhari became president in 2015, up until 2023, the entire Northwest region turned into uh, a war zone. And the, you know, people who were hitherto, uh, you know, uh, pastoralists, headers, tattoo rearers, eventually turned into, uh, in, into terrorists. And it is not so clear who was actually arming these people in the northwest states of Zamfara, Kassina, KB, even up to up to Kaduna, very close to Abuja here. You know, those uh, elements were adequately armed with the state-of-the-art weaponry. In fact, some of the 
arsenals and weapons, the the armed um, uh, headers acquired were much more sophisticated. That a lot more of those weapons that were being used by the offshore All right. armed security forces in Nigeria. So we're concerned about the need for uh, the need for uh, investigation. And it will seem that Nigeria, Nigerian government, the, the current government may not be, All right. may not have the political will, may not have the desire to go into the investigation to find out the okay. remote and immediate causes of the kind of massive killings that took place in the northwest, okay. in the right. southeast also. So you are, you are talking like about election. not just his um, the finance, financials uh, um, that Malam Nurbari talked about, but you're talking about excesses of uh, the Nigerian armed forces in its fight against uh, yeah. insurgency and banditry. Am I correct? About the excesses yet, we have not even got, got, got to the point of excesses. I'm talking about the fact that the president, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, who has the direct command and control over the armed forces of the federation, absconded, abdicated, or willingly forfeited his core duty and responsibility under the constitution Section 14.2.1 uh, of the Constitution says that the primary legal constitutional duty of government, the president, is to secure the lives and property of Nigerians. This primary duty was never done by the president to a point that even within the federal capital territory, it got to a point where some of us who live in the federal capital territory we are very apprehensive. A lot of people in Abuja were not sleeping with their two eyes closed. Okay. The terrorists so actually so you, invaded so you, Abuja. You, so you want, yes, you want Buhari prosecuted for, for all of that. Um, yes. All right. Uh, uh, interesting. I, I will come back to you, uh, sir, um, for more on this, but we'll take a short break. And when we come back, we delve into further aspects of this conversation. Welcome back. Uh, still talking, uh, V statements from President, Mr. President Bola Tinubu, uh, who on Monday said that Nigeria um, is, he meant a country in a precarious financial uh, situation, highly indebted. And also the statement accredited to the current National Security Advisor to Mr. President Nuhuri Badu, who also said um, that Nigeria was in extreme debt uh, and um, of course uh, that the current administration of Bola Metinbo inherited a financially crippled nation, empty coffers, you know, nothing there when they came on board. Our guest tonight, uh, of course, Human Rights Writers Association, as represented by the coordinator, national coordinator, Imanul Owobiko. Uh, he, is, he joins us via video link. They are the ones calling on the International Criminal Court uh, for the prosecution of former President Mohamed Buhari uh, for, amongst other things, uh, neglecting Nigeria's uh, security, the security of Nigerians, the wealth of Nigerians, and also I think for that um, uh, fact or that allegation that he left empty coffers. Also we have on the program uh, Kletu Sobun, he is a former lawmaker and also a member of the All Progressives Congress. And we have um, former National Publicity Secretary of uh, the Labour Party, his legal practitioner Monday Mawadi will join us on the program tonight. Um, uh, over to you, um, Mr. Monday Barrister, uh, uh, Mr. Monday Mawa. What are your thoughts on what um, you've heard from uh, the Huriwa man who was given reasons why his organization is asking for the prosecution of Muhammad Buhari? When we talk about international criminal courts, we're looking at things that are very, very serious in terms of you know, war crimes, international crimes, crimes against humanity. Um, do you feel that these... Uh, the actions of Buhari beat leaving empty coffers or neglecting, you know, the security or being complicit or neglecting to secure, um, failing to secure Nigerians uh, adequately during his time as president are heavy enough to be called crimes against humanity that should be taken before the International Criminal Court. Thank you very much. I think I need quickly let me correct this. I'm not the former. I'm the current Deputy National Secretary of Labour Party. 
Sorry I'm about that. Practice. Current De Deputy yeah. National Secretary of the Labour Party. Yes, Thank Deputy you. National Secretary of the Labour Party. Yes. Thank now, you. I think uh, if we follow the trend in Nigeria security issue carefully from 2015 to Buhari handed over, I think that should be the worst security period of our national history. Now, bearing in mind also the fact that one of the major reasons that Buhari was voted in the office was the fact that he made us to believe that the pocket of security issue that we are experiencing during other essentially President Bull of Jonathan as at that time, that he was going to arrest that situation within the period of six months. Unfortunately, Buhari coming into government escalated the whole security situation in, in, in that region. No longer just that region. Again, I think if also, I, I need to take us back briefly. When Jonathan was there, the security issue then was largely around the Northeast, very far, very far Northeast. But when Buhari came in, I think I will, I, I will not be wrong to say Buhari came in with security issue. Because beyond the issue of uh, Boko Haram, which Jonathan left behind, Buhari came in and brought, we, we got to know issue of rampart kidnapping during Buhari era. We got to know issue of a banditry during Buhari era. So it was a, a, the situation of security during Buhari was thing from just from the northeast to the, across the country. Is it not? Is this the uh, southeast? Is this south south? Is this southwest? So name them. Buhari regime spread. I will use the word spread security issue across board. No longer just a particular region that we that we, the Jonathan left it, and of course. Don't also forget we're having the like of people like uh, bring back our girls that were championed by the, by this professor Equesile. And at the end of the day, some of us were now wondering where did she suddenly disappear to after forcing the like of Jonathan out on the issue of security and Buhari came on board and we experienced worse thing. Now, what I will say about that is that the numbers of people that have died during the reign of Buhari from eight years, I mean it's enough for the International Criminal Court to call upon Buhari to come and answer as the man that was at the helm of affairs. So now if you look at the number of money that was budgeted into security during that eight years, Buhari cannot justify any of those money. And then you now ask yourself, what did they do with all of those money? What did they do with all of those okay. funds? Okay, Monday, because... thank you so much. I'll come back to you. Uh, I want to go back to Kletis okay. Obun because uh, the pres former presidential candidate of Kletus's party in uh, uh, the 2023 elections, Peter Obi, uh, who is positioning himself as the leader of Nigeria's opposition. Uh, he's calling on President Bola Tirubu to disclose the assets and deficit that he is saying he inherited by, uh, from uh, Buhari's government or administration. Uh, 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 Kletus, what are, what's your take on this? What do, you, do you agree that it's crucial that President Tirubu does not just say in Saudi Arabia, oh, um, I inherited de deficits, you know, liabilities from uh, Buhario, but that he should actually publish, tell Nigerians in black and white, what are the assets, what are the liabilities that the former administration handed over to him? You think this is, this is crucial for the sake of transparency? Curtis. Coffee? Coffee? Coffee, please, let me make this point. If a, a chief verifier, a man who comes every time and reels out figures of cough and then begins to ask that he should be given. First, there is a Freedom of Information Bill, which authorizes any Nigerian, it doesn't have to be opposition, even APC members, yes. and walk to any office and demand that. Indeed, what we should be having, and this is exactly why they went into the, uh, the court and we said the time of the court, I was very disappointed that the Supreme Court didn't slam them with collateral damages for, that, for wasting the time of the court. This is exactly the kind of attitude they put up. When you see responsible Nigerians, I'll take you, if you are doing that, you don't need to be a student of comparative politics to know that Israel, Israeli Mossad, is one of the best security of forces on earth. How many days ago you saw what happened there? You are talking about war crimes and criminal court and all that. I'm not a defender of Buhari. I will never accept that our security should be compromised to the point where we can no longer come out to greet. 
But the way of manner it is exaggerated is such that you will feel that in this Abuja, you can't even come to Raya studio. That in Lagos, you cannot even go out to buy anything. That is the kind of picture they paint of a country they want to move from uh, consumption to production. When you demarket your own country like that and paint a picture that no man is living free, and you are living in that same country, and carry out campaign and say you want to need it, how do you, there must be a, a stop to where patriotism comes in and where politics starts. You must be able to differentiate that All in right. which you stand for your country, okay, no us. matter what. Thank you, Now, in this context, yeah. let me tell you about the security situation they are talking about. In 2014, if you remember, the entire Northeast was taken over. When Dwari came in there, what did he do? He moved the war theater to Meduguri. He moved the theater of war, the, 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 the defense theater to Meduguri. And of course, you notice that those people were outgunned and they moved to the Northeast. You're talking about the command and control Boko center. Haram. They didn't go to Boko Haram. They didn't go there. They became bandits, which is a shadow of the horror that Boko Haram represented. Today, we are not discussing Boko Haram anymore the way we do. We are discussing it in 2013, 2014. Right. What we are right. discussing is banditry and order. Thank you. Uh, point, I, uh, I want to bring in uh, Emmanuel Ombiko at this point. Emmanuel, what do you say to what Clezos has said? That, you know what? Nothing stops anyone from uh, approaching you know, the government to say she was like Obi is calling for the details of the liability that uh, Buhari left. But to, to your specific point of uh, the culpability of President Buhari in the security um, uh, attacks that and, and uh, breaches that Nigerians were exposed to, he's saying that uh, you know it is not the way you're painting it out to be. And I will add to what he said to ask you, um, can Ruhuriwa not approach the International Criminal Court themselves? Why are you making a press statement calling for who are you even calling on to prosecute Buhari? Imano Lombiko, please. The, um, the misperception uh, and the kind of uh, half-baked propaganda that uh, your other guest is trying to use your station to circulate. If he, if he feels that the country is as safe as he is talking about, let him jump to uh, let him jump into the next available bus and travel to Zanzara as we speak. If you jump from that, if he's in Lagos, wherever he is, jump into a bus now and come to Abuja. Go to uh, go to Kaduna and go to Zamfara and go to Kasara. If he come back, if he, if he if he comes back to Lagos alive without being kidnapped, then he can begin to say what he's saying. He don't just sit down in in a corner of Lagos and start saying the situation is not uh, as it is. It was during the Buhari's administration that virtually all the police stations in the southeast were booked. and nobody okay, is too Imano, sure. Before, 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 before we continue with you, sorry. Who are responsible for the burning of yeah, these police Imano. stations? Emmanuel, please, can you move yes. backward a bit and just relax into your seat so we can see you properly? And please continue. Yeah. I said, you know, when there is this proverb in my language that says, when a dead body that does not belong to a particular family is being carried, you know, across the road, the, the person observing who is not a member of that family, we look at it like, maybe what are they even carrying? Maybe they're just carrying out that stick. So he's just saying that maybe because they have not been affected by by, uh, you know, uh, insecurity that uh, Buhari unleashed on this on this country in a very massive scale. I've just told you that during the eight year uh, administration of that government, prior to that administration, there was never any incident of attack of any police station anywhere in the southeast. It was when the government came and uh, it carried out an illegal rendition of the, uh, the gentle Okay, we, we seem to have a connection problem with Maru. Uh, Cletus, what do you say to that? Very briefly, please. What's your response to what Imano yeah, Let me say that uh, when he says I'm exaggerating or I'm feeling that unconcerned, as I speak to you now, a professor, my own classmate in the University of Calabar, has not been kidnapped. He's from Bekwara. You say you know Crossover very well. Yeah. He's from Abuja. Professor Gaga is still in the hands of kidnappers. We've never witnessed that. I am saying that this is a global and a national crisis to which we should look for solutions. For instance, I want to hear him and the human rights group say, why can't Nigeria bring unmanned drones? I have gone to the internet. It's less than $30 million uh, to buy a drone. Why won't Nigeria invest on such things? Why won't we have combat helicopters in the southeast, like two or three, in the northwest, where you have seven states, with them like, like three or four? The state can aggregate money along with the federal government, bring those things, and improve our security network. How did this boy, American, was kidnapped and taken to uh, Brindingwari? 
and America could move all the way from Washington, all walk right. into that place. Okay. So you're saying it's, it's a global crisis of insecurity uh, that, that is not limited or peculiar to Nigeria. Uh, Emmanuel, what do you say to that? There's a final take from you before we go. That this is that whatever happened as security, you know, situation in Nigeria that affected I, a lot I of people. Gave a, I gave him a challenge. I gave you a, I guess, a challenge. Let him join the next available bus and travel to Zamfara. Probably he can even go with the camera and record his movement. If you think the insecurity, uh, the insecurity situation in Nigeria hasn't got that bad, let me tell you, 70 percent of travelers today, people traveling either from the uh, from the north to the south or traveling from Abuja to Paracos or Abuja to any part of the southeast of Abuja to Lagos, 70 percent of those who used to travel by road have now started traveling by air. That is why uh, even getting a seat now on any flight is as difficult as a camera passing through the eye of a needle. The security situation right. in Nigeria is at a very disturbing level. It was at a very disturbing level, at a very, very, uh, a very despicable level during the administration of uh, Buhari, which his, uh, his, his friend, the uh, current president, inherited. <laughs> and the problems have not completely been put off. The situation has not affected right. because Emmanuel, only Obiko. A, few months, uh, a few weeks ago, in August, 30 soldiers were killed in Niger State. 30 soldiers were killed in Niger State. A few days ago, the governor of Niger State told us that okay. Emmanuel, the government uh, discovered 70 bodies, 70 decomposing bodies. Are, are, you, are you saying something? I think let us responding to you. But gentlemen, I'm afraid we, we have to say goodbye. Uh, it's been a very thrilling conversation and, and glad we had both of you on the program tonight. And uh, thank you so very kindly for your time. Mano Obiko, who is the National Coordinator of Human Rights, uh, Writers Association of Nigeria, calling on uh, the ICC to prosecute former President Mount Wari. Also, Tessa Sobon, a former lawmaker and member of the All Progressives Congress, is from Cross River State. Gentlemen, thanks for your time.